This video is about the Z-transform and its poles, zeros, and region of convergence. As in the video about the Laplace transform, I will not be going into detailed math, but will rather talk about concepts. I will motivate the discussion by looking at systems described by constant coefficient difference equations in the discrete time domain, which apply to a very broad class of problems. We'll start with the definition of the Z-transform. The Z-transform denoted by z of h of n, so it's acting on a discrete time system, is defined as the summation from negative infinity to infinity of h of n multiplied by z to the minus n, where z is going to be a complex value, and we'll denote it as r e to the j omega, so it has a magnitude r, and a phase omega. This is just a polar notation of rectangular coordinates that are used to represent a complex value. And then this can be written as h of z. A very nice property of the z-transform that we're going to use is that a delay in the time domain corresponds to a multiplication by z, a power of z, in the z-transform domain. Specifically, h of n minus n zero going through the z-transform corresponds to z to the minus n zero times the z-transform of h. As a specific example, suppose we have y of n minus three that corresponds to z to the minus 3 times y of z. This is very useful because it'll help us to deal with difference equations. In the continuous time domain we talked about differential equations, while in the discrete time domain we talk about difference equations, where the most general kind of difference equation with linear constant coefficients is going to be written as follows. Taking the z-transform of both sides, we get this. And then we can write the transfer function of this system, h of z, which is equal to y of z over x of z, as the ratio of these polynomials, which is this. These polynomials can furthermore be written in a different form, where instead of a polynomial, we can factor it, and we're going to end up with something in this form where we have a constant c that was factored out front, and the polynomials in terms of their roots, with m roots on top and n roots on the bottom. And the roots of the numerator correspond to the zeros of the transfer function, while the roots of the denominator correspond to the poles. The zeros are the locations where the entire transfer function goes to zero, since each one of these terms will create zero, and so h of z goes to zero and the poles are the locations where the transfer function goes to infinity since they will place a zero in the denominator and that would make the function go to infinity. We can once again represent the function, the transfer function, by the poles and zeros in the z-plane. So this will be our z-plane where this axis will be the real component of z and this one will be the imaginary component of z, since z is a complex value, r e to the j omega. And each one of these zeros and poles will be represented by circles for zeros and x's for poles. And here I've drawn one real pole, two complex conjugates, and one real zero. Just like with the Laplace transform, there's going to be an associated region of convergence for the z-transform. To see why this is the case, let's once again look at the mathematical form of the z-transform. The z-transform of h of n is defined as the summation of h of n times z to the minus n. Well, as we mentioned, z is equal to r e to the j omega. So this whole thing will be equal to the summation of h of n 
times r to the minus n times e to the minus j omega n. Just breaking this up into two parts. Well, this can be further written as the summation of h of n times r to the minus n times e to the minus j omega n. And this is the discrete time Fourier transform of h of n multiplied by r to the minus n. As we saw with the Laplace transform, we're basically multiplying our function, our signal, by some something else, r to the minus n in this case, and then we're taking the Fourier transform. That's another way to look at the z transform. But we also know that the Fourier transform only exists for stable signals, and so this means that if this r to the minus n is able to stabilize the signal, then we can take the Fourier transform. Basically what this corresponds to is that there is a region of convergence in the z-plane characterized by r, which is going to tell us whether or not the Fourier transform exists and whether or not this whole function is stable. Whereas with the Laplace transform, we characterize everything in terms of sigma, which was just the real axis. Here we're characterizing it by r. And r is the magnitude in the polar notation of the complex number. So therefore, we're characterizing things outside of circles and inside of circles as the region of convergence. As before, the region of convergence is going to be delineated by the poles and the outermost pole or the innermost pole is going to decide the region of convergence because a pole cannot be in the region of convergence as by definition the transfer function explodes, goes to infinity for a pole. Therefore it cannot be in the region of convergence. And here I've marked the region a possible delineation of the region of convergence and we'll say that everything outside of this region converges. Therefore we're able to evaluate h of z at any z point outside of the circle over here, characterized by this r value. So once again, even though we can find the value of the z transform for any value of z, which is r e to the j omega, all we have to mark are the poles and zeros because they fully define the entire transfer function, as was written up here and as we can see in this plot here. So let's look at a concrete example to solidify some of these concepts. We have the following difference equation. Taking the z transform of both sides, we get, and writing the transfer function h of z as y of z over x of z, we get the following ratio. We can then rewrite this in the form that we want as this. And finally, in the pole zero notation, we can write it as follows. And here we see that we have one zero at negative one half and another at zero, and two complex conjugate poles. We can draw this in the z-plane with one zero over here and another at the origin, and two complex conjugate poles, something like this. And this fully characterizes our z-transform. Here is an illustration of what this looks like using MATLAB. And we can see our two zeros and the complex conjugate poles with a circle here corresponding to the border of the region of convergence, which can lie either outside of this circle or inside of it. And it's marked by the two poles. The green circle here is the unit circle for reference. And again, this has all the information about the z-transform, but we can also look at this kind of a plot, where again, if we look at it from a two-dimensional point of view, we see the same kind of thing where we have the region of convergence. Here I've made it be outside of these poles, so the function is defined for everything outside of the circle with these two poles. But we can also turn it on its side and see that we have values for every value of z that's in the region of convergence with this explosion happening at the poles and the function going to zero at the zero locations. But it's defined everywhere outside as well. Overall, 
we have seen how the z-transform is characterized by a ratio of polynomials in z and is therefore fully defined by these poles and zeros. We have also seen what the poles and zeros mean and we have shown the entire z-plane for a particular example.